Okay, so we're going to do letter B off page 238 of your packet here because it's also the one I think is the most interesting. 238, yep. Oh, what did I say? Okay. Just making sure. So this is 32, 18, 18, 20. Obviously not drawn to scale. 30, 26. And of course over here, this is going to be a full 56 feet if we just add up 18, 18, and 20. And our beam goes down through here. We said to center it on this end. So this is 16 and 16. Now we don't have measurements for our beam buildup, but we can go off of their locations. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven gaps there. What's 56 divided by seven? What's 56 divided by 7? Eight. 8. There we go. So there's 7 gaps. Now obviously I didn't space them real well because I didn't get my other dimensions real well. But each of these is 8 feet. Which means for our beams we're probably going to use 16 foot material. If I remember it, the packet said assume you can't get anything over 20 feet. In reality... Um, anything over 16 foot is extremely expensive. So here's going to be my build up. I'm going to do 8 foot, or not 8 foot, 16 foot, 16 foot, 16 foot, and 8 foot. So that is 3 16s and 1 8. My next layer, I'm going to go 8 foot, so I'm seamed at a different place, spliced at a different spot. So 8, 16, 16, 16. So that's three more 16s and one more 8. And my third ply is going to look just like the first. So three more and one more. So that means we have a total of nine 16 footers and three 8 footers. That is my beam builder. Does that make sense? I forgot to do my sills. My sills are going to be found by just doing the perimeter of this. If I find the perimeter of this, it is what? 88, 176, 184. Is that what you get when you add up the perimeter? <coughs> so 184 feet of sills. So I've got girder. I've got sills. Next, well, bridging material. Where are there going to be more than a 10 foot span? This is a 16 foot span. This is a 16 foot span. This is a 10 foot span. Don't need any there. This is going to be. What's that? Anything over eight feet? Okay. We'll go out. We'll go for 10 feet for now. I'm um, just because that's what I told you. Did you do eight feet? So you did bridging everywhere. Okay, so you would have had 112 times 3 or 336 feet of bridging. Yeah, so here if we add these all up, it comes out instead of 112, it comes out to a 94 times 3. So 282 feet of bridging. If you'd add either one, would be fine. So for bridging, either 282 or 336. <clears throat> I think code is 8 foot or code is 10 foot so that's our bridging Joyce <coughs> Joyce are going to be a little more fun so we do go section by section let's go this section here first Joyce spacing, did I give you the joyce spacing? 16 on center. Perfect. That's what I would have told you to do. 
So for our joists, <coughs> that is 56 linear feet. They're all 16 feet long, right? So the number of joists there, it's 12 over our on center spacing. So 12 over 16, right? the package just says 3 fourths. Times the length, which is 56, plus 1, because there's 1 on each end, right? So, 12 over 56 plus 1 is what, 43? 12 divided by 16 times 56 plus 1 is 43. Very good. On the other side, we've got an additional 18 feet that we're going to have to put Joyce on. <coughs> Are we going to add one to that? Yes. Here's the thing. Do we come out to having a joist? This is not modular. It's not divisible by four. Remember, 16 inch on center has come out at four foot. So the last full 16 foot joist is going to be somewhere in here. We're going to round up, but we will not add one. Just for that short one. What's going to happen is we're going to actually put in a little six foot joist here, a rim joist. Then we'll continue here with the next joist. Okay? So we do round up because when we do this, we get 13.5, I believe. So that's going to be 14 more. So these are our 16 footers here. So 16 foot, I need 57 of them. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Next, I'm going to do my 10 footers here. These are 10 footers. I've got 18 feet across there. Now, I, do I need one at the beginning? <coughs> no, I don't. Do I need one at the end? No, I don't. Because at the end, I'm going to run this one all the way out. How do I know that one's going to run all the way out and not just be a short one? Well, because 18 and 18 is 36, so we're modular to here. That's divisible by 4. So this will be exactly on a joist here. So we will put a full-length joist there. So for 10, the 10-footers the there, it's going to be our number of joists is 12 over 16 times that 18 feet minus 1. Because we don't need one at the beginning or at the end. So that's 13.5 minus 1 is 12.5. So we're going to do 13 of those. So 10 footers, we need 13 joists. <coughs> For our 14 footers, since we are modular here and we are going to need one here, we do need one on both ends over a 20 foot span. So our 14 footers, number of joists, 12 sixteenths times 20 plus 1 is going to be 16 of them. There's one thing I'm missing yet. This little six footer. So one six foot rim joist and 56 plus another 56 feet or 112 feet of rim joist out there. The six foot, I labeled it as rim joist because it doesn't have to be structural. That's going to sit on top of the wall the whole way. So I don't need to worry about structure of that. I just have to make sure it's the right height for the floor to sit on. All it has to hold is any compression force from that corner of the floor. It actually, it actually is going to hold the compression force from the wall above, basically. <coughs> the 112 foot of rim joist is not broken down by length because it really doesn't matter what length we use the rim joist. Now somebody asks, well, why don't we just order all 16s and let them overlap if they're too long in spots? 
<clears throat> doesn't sound like a horrible question, but there's two good reasons. One, 14s and 10s usually are much, much cheaper by the linear foot. Second, you're only not supposed to allow the joist, I believe it's 12 inches. You're not supposed to allow a joist to overlap by more than 12 inches. Because if they do overlap, what happens is, here's your beam, here's your outer wall here, right? Your outer wall here. This joist sits on there, but when weight sits, it gets on it, it bows like that, right? Same over here, this joist sits there, but when weight gets on it, it bows down a little bit as well. See what's happening right here? If those overlap at 12 inches, they're only going to bow up like a 16th or nothing, not enough to do damage. If you bought like 16 footers instead of 10s and let them overlap by 6 feet, that bow up might be a good half inch. It might actually pop the floor. Pop the floor loose, bust the screws or pry off the glue, or maybe even pop through the subfloor and do damage to your main floor. If it's got tight, if you were to tile that floor, it's going to bust up your tile for sure. <coughs> Most likely, yes. Yeah, so there's, I mean, it's not huge, if you, especially if you have big enough floor joists, it's not going to be a huge difference, but it can be, you know, an eighth of an inch can be enough to do some damage. Yeah. Well, at the very least, it causes your floor to creak because it's going to pull it up off of the joist and separate any adhesive adhesion you've got to avoid this. One of the biggest mistakes people do with subfloors, um, they think, oh, I'm going to glue it down so I don't need a few screws in it. And I still screw the heck out of it. Yeah. Make darn sure that glue bonds so you don't get creaks in it. There's nothing more annoying than a creaky floor. It's, it's a lot harder to, <coughs> to over nail something than under nail. Like, uh, I'll, I'll nail the fifth out of it. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to like big headers and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's way more difficult to put too many nails in it than. <coughs> so anyway, those are our joists. Next, we need floor coverings. So floor coverings, we've got. All we need to do is find the area. We've got one that's thirty-two by eighteen. For what? 576 square feet. The next section is what, 26 by 18. Which is what, four, what's that? 648. I was gonna say, that seems off to me. I was getting like 468, there you go. And our last section is 20 here by 30. 30 by 20 is going to be 600. So that all adds up to 1,644. Is that correct? <coughs> Perfect. We're going to divide that by what? 32, where's 32 come from? Thirty-two is the area of a four by eight sheet of plywood. Fifty one, so fifty two sheets. Is there going to be waste on this floor? Yes, there will be. So what's going to happen, this is not modular. So we have four foot by four foot. You cut a sheet in half, right? And works at four foot. So this is going to probably hang over at least two feet here and two feet here because you've got four foot wide. So that's going to come out at 28, not 26. Here it's going to hang out two feet. I did that wrong. That should have been shorter. It should have been back in here. I'll redraw it. Yep, 
This is going to hang out probably two feet here as well because it's 30, so 32 is where it would be modular. So you're going to lose that much. Um, this is going to be probably, you know, three sheets. You're going to lose a half a sheet on. Here, this is going to be three sheets or two and a half sheets in each spot. And then you're going to lose another half. So you're probably going to lose five sheets. You know, yeah, two and a half half sheets. So you're going to use at least three sheets of, of material here. Um, <clears throat> all depends on how you go about it. You can avoid some of that problem, but there's still going to be waste. Personally, I would never design a house to these dimensions. It's always best to design a house divisible by four. <coughs> So that's it. That wasn't so bad, was it? So how about number of studs? Well, to do number of studs, you got to have a little bit more information. So we're going to start out with a simple rectangle. And we're going to make this rectangle 32 by 46. To find the number of exterior studs, first thing you're going to do is you're going to find the perimeter. So the perimeter here is what, 70. 8156. Double check me. You guys got those fancy calculating machines in front of you. Correct. Forty six plus thirty two plus forty six plus thirty two. <coughs> We're still going to assume sixteen inch spacing, so our number of studs is going to be twelve over sixteen times our perimeter. Here's one hundred seventeen studs. Notice I did not add one or subtract one or anything like that because this is not just single walls we have here. This is the whole perimeter I did. Technically, we should have an extra starter or ender at each wall. So what we're going to do, each corner of the house is a plus two. <clears throat> Why is it a plus two? Well, there's two reasons. One is... We need the one at the beginning. This formula doesn't apply for the doesn't get calculated one at the beginning of each wall, right? So one of those for the corner is a one for the beginning. The second thing is when you frame a corner. So let's say this wall goes this way here. So you put the stud right here. The next one's over here at 16 inches. This wall is actually fine. You got a stud right here. I can sheet it outside here. Got stuff to nail the sheeting to. Over here, I've got stuff to nail the sheeting to. The problem is on the inside. Sheetrock here is fine. I got something to nail sheetrock to. But on this side, I got nothing to nail it to. So generally, there's another stud put in here, like that. So one and one of the big things, one of the big things I see people forget to do before you sheet the outside of the house, insulate the corner. do that that's the insulation right <coughs> insulate those corners or leave this you can you can float sheetrock by several inches actually I think they say up to six inches on for for a uh, half inch sheetrock and up to 12 inches I believe for five eighths float it yeah so you can actually leave this stud a few inches away from the corner so that you've got room you can shove insulation in from the inside 
once you, a lot of people don't like to insulate it because if you don't get a roof on it right away, it can get wet. So I generally will just leave a few inches there so I can actually insulate that. It, it's a pain to shove it in there, but you can still shove it full of insulation from the inside and you're done. So that's why you add two. There's one for the starter and then one to do a nailer for the sheetrock on the inside. <coughs> Some people will actually put this one in and then they'll start their 16 inch spacing from here. I've never cared for that because then you're cutting off sheeting. Sheetrock is usually cheaper than OSB sheeting. So I'd rather waste sheetrock than OSB. Not to mention you can also you can always piece sheetrock back together and mud the mud the heck out of it and reuse it if you have small pieces. So you add two for each corner. So for this one it's going to be plus four or plus eight, sorry, for corners. For each odd length wall it's going to be plus one. What do I mean by odd length? I don't mean even or odd like 37 is odd and 36 is even. I mean non-modular length. In other words, not divisible by 4. 32 is divisible by 4. So those two walls are okay. 46, however, is not. So those two walls are considered odd length walls. So I have two odd length walls. So I'm going to add two for that. For each window or door, I'm going to add two. Now, I didn't put windows or doors in here yet. So I'm going to add some stuff here quick. So, window, 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 door, window, window. There. <coughs> In the pack, I think it only said windows. We are going to do both doors and windows. So, we have one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine windows and one, two doors. So that is a total of 11 times two, which gives us plus 22 for door and windows. <coughs> Why do we only add two? Why doesn't it matter what size the window is? Some people ask, why do we add anything? Because the windows, you need less studs. You know, you're not going to have studs in the window. <coughs> well, headers are generally going to be bigger than 2 by 6s You're going to have to figure your header material, which is whatever the length, whatever the width of your window is, plus usually plus 6 inches or plus 3 inches, depending on its length. Or actually, usually plus 4 or plus 7, because you're going to add a half inch of extra on each end generally. Usually you only do a quarter inch, but you, know, you estimate high. <laughs> Shoulder studs, yeah, that's the name, that the, the correct name now, I guess. Yeah, I'm not supposed to call them that anymore, no. So here's your wall with your standard stud spacing going off to the side. You're right, you do your shoulder stud here. Your header does not count for this. But you do still sometimes have to put jack studs up above here. But you think, well, what about all these? Well, you still have to have jack studs down below the window, too, 
You want to keep them in line so they line up with your sheeting, so if a sheet, piece of sheeting ends there. Then you also have to put a bottom plate down across here. And that bottom plate generally takes up most of what would have been <coughs> your other studs there. So, I mean, your framing for the window itself takes up most of what would have been there for studs. So you, the extras are for these extra shoulder studs. So that's what the two are. For a door, it's the same thing. It's smaller. <coughs> um, some people design their windows so that this header is always tight to the top plate, the double top plate, so you don't have the jack studs up above it, which is not a bad plan, but if you, if you have eight-foot ceilings, and it's actually relatively easy to make it work out that way, I've always been one of those people that's very uptight about my designs. Um, let's say I have a door. Do you guys know standard door height? No. No. Six foot eight. Six foot eight. Huh? Eighty inches. So generally your door opening is eighty one and a half to eighty two inches because you have that three quarter inch top on your door. The jam. The jam, part of the jam. I couldn't think of, for some reason, I was blacking out on jam. Um, <clears throat> and also, you usually leave your doors about a half inch or three quarters inch off the floor for flooring. Because you're going to have carpet or whatever. And it's nice to put that underneath the bottom of the jam. Otherwise, you got to trim the jam. And if you have a shaggy carpet, it keeps your door from rubbing on the carpet as well. I mean, you don't want it too far up because you don't want to see that there's a gap at the bottom of the door. But you want it up so if you tile or whatever, it's relatively simple to put it underneath. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, minimum is a quarter inch. So you can put an eighth inch glue on and, and then linoleum or vinyl, whatever flooring you put down. Um, the quarter inch is not adequate if you're going to put down tile. You need three eighths to half an inch. So I usually leave them a half inch off the floor. That way carpet fits under them nice and neatly and you can pull it back out without having to. I know some people will put their flooring down first and then set the door down on top of it. Uh, that's, that's a real pain. <laughs> that can be a real pain. Um, I still will give it a quarter inch gap or a, at least a three sixteenths gap. I mean, you just put a shim under it and level it out. But so if you ever have to pull that floor out, you've got a little bit of room to work. It's sure. not totally pinching. Because I've seen them where they actually like squeeze it down on top of carpet because they've got a tight header, and to where you can't get that carpet out of there. You're sitting there with a knife scraping out, really scraping under it with a knife, pulling out chunks and snagging chunks. So we got our 22 for doors. The next one is a little confusing for people. Interior partitions. Plus one for each. What that is, is like right here where an interior wall intersects the outside. Why do they do plus one there? I'm sorry, where we like there where a wall hits. Like here, it would be here as well. Go here, 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 here. Anywhere an interior wall it meets the outside wall. <coughs> you need something to nail to. Well, and actually, realistically, you know, if this is your exterior wall, notice your, your double top plates. You can put your interior wall in here like this. And sometimes on the interior walls, you only do a single top plate because you don't need the the strength. The double top plate is so if a truss ends up between studs it doesn't sag. Uh, interior walls you don't necessarily have to have that. But generally you can you can toenail into here into that top plate and anchor that interior wall. But you do get some wobble here a little bit. Um, but generally you don't have a problem with that and it's relatively easy to insulate. But in some many areas code is like this. Now notice that interior wall is narrower because this is usually a two by six, so this is generally five and a half inches out here. This is generally two and two by four, so this is three and a half inches inside. But what we will do is wherever the stud spacings are here, let's just say that's where the stud spacings are on the exterior wall, so that that interior wall comes in totally in between studs. There's the end stud on the interior wall. What they'll generally do is say an extra two by six stud and put it like this. Personally, I don't use 2x6, I use 1x6. A couple of reasons. One, 1x6 one is cheaper. Um, 
to the main reason for that two by six there is when you put sheetrock on. Again. We've got a nailer. Yeah. I mean, it also does stiffen up your wall a little bit so it can't go back and forth. But a one by six stiffens it up just as good as, almost as good as a two by six. The main reason I'll use a one by six a lot of times. Yeah, if you put a two by six there, you're taking an inch and a half out. Now you've only got four inches of insulation there. You're still going to use the same insulation, but it's squeezed down by that inch and a half. And when you compress insulation, if you take those air pockets out of it, it loses a lot of its insulating value. A lot of its R value is in those air pockets. That's why the, 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 you, you fluff it up when you pump. You don't pack it in. You put it in there, you got to get fluffed up just right to get the best. The, push it up. Yeah, you want to make sure it's fluffed up. If you get it compressed, it actually loses some of its R value. <coughs> yep. But what you, what you really should do is you get it pushed in so it's tight out to the wall and then pull it back out a little bit. Because yep. when you just push it in, the edges can catch and they can curl back in. Um, so you get problems there. Now one of the things... Uh, so uh, let's finish this off here. So we've got... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of those. So we're going to do plus ten for interior partitions. So we've got what? They're 125, 127, 149, 159. Let's start. <clears throat> Not bad? No, 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 no. Interior. Interior studs. If you're one stud per foot. Now, I'll be honest with you. A lot of people figure one stud per foot for exterior studs, too. We had a perimeter of 156 feet. We figure 159 studs. It's really, really close. Now, if you're running a quick estimate, one stud per foot on the exterior, unless you have an exception. Actually, this actually has a considerable amount of windows in it. I mean, this does, it looks like a relatively simple floor plan, but there's actually a lot of interior partitions and windows and stuff. So usually one stud per foot is good. Interior studs, it is just one stud per foot, and you don't have to get crazy about it. Let's see, I've got here, here, and here go all the way across. Here and here go almost all the way across again. So that's 32 and 32. That's 64 feet. Does that make sense? I'm just doing a rough estimate. So I'm just going, I know this is 32 feet from here to here, right? So there's, I'm going to count that as one trip across, that, those three go together as one trip across, and there's 232s. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Now, I didn't give you any other dimensions here for this direction. So I'm really not going to do a whole lot, but let's just say this is about halfway. So this and this are going to add up to the full 46. Make sense? We're just, again, rough estimates. Normally there'd be dimensions like this might be a 9 by 12 room, and this might be 6 by 8 or whatever. Or probably 6 by 9, I would have to say, so it stays even. But you get the point? So you go off of those dimensions to figure out your walls. But you just got to be careful. You know that you make sure you only count each wall once. So I actually do either take a red pen or a highlighter, and as I figure in the walls, I highlight them. Because when I do this room, okay, I count this wall and this wall. I don't need to count that wall again when I do this room. It's already been counted. So interior walls, that's it. I haven't done these two yet. Um, that's probably going to be less than 30 feet. Let's just do this. Let's say that that is a... It says given is 10 by 12. So you've got 22 feet there. 10 by 12. Add those all up. That's your number of feet. 64, um, 110, 132. 132 feet, so 132 studs.
<clears throat> generally that covers your corners that covers your doorways you don't need a whole lot of headers for doors inside unless you're going to have some sort of an upper level if it, <coughs> yes yeah Usually I add, depending on what I'm estimating, I'll do usually 10% over. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Like for roofing, I have a, a floating scale for my my error. If I have just a straight ranch style house, I'm usually just a 5 or a 10% is what I add for, for waste. If I have valleys and stuff in it, I look at how many valleys and I'll pump it up. I mean, I've had some houses where I've done as much as a 20 or 25% waste. If I've got valleys and dormers and all sorts of funny looking things where I'm going to have to do a lot of cutting and a lot of overlapping in my valleys and stuff. Yeah, piled valley or something like that. <clears throat> yep. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I do a lot of stuff like that. That's basically it for this packet. So, you guys should be able to go to the back page and do those problems I gave you. There may be a quiz at some point in your future where I give you a quiz and say, hey, count the number of studs, count the floor joists, count all this lovely stuff. Well, as long as we got.